Because you could ask. Look at the camera and ask. Yeah, right. I will. I will do that in just a minute. I, I think maybe we should. Uh, I don't know. Why don't we go ahead and get started? How's that sound? Okay. Um, okay. Let me let me just say a few words. So I think we're gonna go ahead and get started um, now. Uh, Professor Ding, if you are online, can you maybe send me an email? I'm Tim. Uh, it's o to umbc.edu, just so that we can know that you're there. Um, so I'm happy to uh, introduce Kavita Krishnaswamy, who is defending her PhD thesis proposal tonight. Um, we've been working together for quite some time. I think. Um, hey, that's okay. I, I, you know, we'll just do the standard sort of proceedings. So she has a talk that uh, you know probably lasts an hour, you know, give or take. Um, uh, and feel free to ask questions as we go. Uh, once the talk is over, we'll let the committee go around and ask any residual questions that they have, and then um, you know, if people in the audience want to ask questions, we'll do that. Um, you know, and then we'll excuse everybody. The committee will deliberate, and we'll we'll see what happens. Um, so one thing I will say is that uh, Kavita has said that there might come a time during the presentation where she'll need to take a break for a couple of minutes. Um, I told her I thought that would be fine, and she'll just let us know if she needs to do that, and then we'll you know go get more food or whatever. Um, so unless there's anything else, I'll let Kavita take it away. Thank you. All right, thanks. So good evening, everyone. I want to thank Dr. Rose for the intro and for being my advisor and the chair, and I want to thank the committee members, Dr. Dean, Dr. Finan, Dr. Nicholas, and Dr. Yesha. Thank you so much for being the committee members and uh, giving your contribution for this research. So tonight I'm going to share with you my dissertation on the topic and my research plan to increase autonomy with the robotics for daily living. So next slide, please. So just a little bit about me. I received my Bachelor of Science from the UMBC, dual major in computer science and math. And recently, I worked at the Quality, Quality of Life Technology Center, the Fox Center. It's a collaboration between Carnegie Mellon and the University of Pittsburgh. And it's also the National Science Foundation's Engineering Research Center. And they do a lot of robotics research and assistive techniques. And I have a passion for robotics research. And there are several reasons for that. So one of which is to alleviate the challenges of my physical disability. I have a spinal muscular atrophy. It's a progressive condition. There's no cure or treatment. And I need a lot of help to, from a daily living tasks. And my mother is my primary caregiver. The situation here, though, is my mom is getting older. And the situation is that as she is getting older, she needs to take care of herself. And take care of the unit at the same time. So we have to find a technological solution because there's a growing need that I need to be independent as well. Next slide, please. So this is our agenda for this evening. First, we're going to discuss, discuss why there's a need for assistive robotics. We're going to go over some of the grand challenges and the research goals of this uh, thesis topic. And I'm also going to share with you work that other people have done in this research field. Also share with you some of the pilot studies that we've conduct, conducted that serve the foundation as well. And then I'll show you some of the prototype designs that's a part of the current research progress that's going on. And I'll also show you a proposed solution and the scheduled milestone. Next slide, please. So now we're at the introduction. Next slide, please. So robotics exists in a variety of fields. In the industry, you know, for manufacturing, where robots perform automated tasks, and for space exploration. Even yesterday, I saw in the news that uh, NASA's Curiosity rover went to Mars and it detected a crater. So it's very innovative research that's going on, and it's possibility that crater may have water. So robotics is useful in that field as well. Also, robots are very useful for 
assist of services for helping people with disabilities and the elderly. Although there is a lot of research being done in the robotics fields and in many different aspects, there isn't uh, much research done for personal care in particular. So we're going to focus on that and try to find a solution for that. Next slide, please. Okay. Hey, Kavita. Yes. I'm going to try and dial in uh, Dr. Ding. So, Yelena, if we lose you, we'll call you back, okay? Okay, no problem. Okay, yeah. Please proceed. Go ahead. Okay. So, now I'm going to share with you some statistical data from the World Health Organization and the United States. Census Bureau. We have that there's about 36.1 million people in the U.S. that have some form of disability, and that's about 12 percent of the total population. And even among that population, 73 percent of them specifically have a physical disability. So this population is pretty huge. And on the other side, if you look at the we have about one billion people. Hi, Dr. Ding. This is. Hey, I'm sorry, Kavita. Just one more second. Hi, this is Tim. We're uh, we're going to conference you in, okay? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Hang on one second. If I lose you, I'll call you back. So you think Flash and this hard for? Oh, dude, you lied to me. <laughs> Mr. Google said. Hello? Hello? Is this uh, Dr. Ding? Yeah, this is she. Okay. Uh, I think we've lost Yelena, though. Uh, I can get her on the cell phone. I phone her in. Here, try, okay. Try, try a flash start. Uh, He's not going to listen to your advice again. <laughs> Uh, what do you think? You could get her on Google Hangout, just like a simple Google Hangout. Nah. Um, <clears throat> and also, I think there's a problem on the Hangout, right? Try, try, try Flash and dial your lane back. Okay. Hang on, let me see. Flash. Is this Star 4 or Star 6? Star 4. Hello, I'm back. Hey, let me try and uh, conference. Do you know Do you know if I've got two people on, do I hit Flash and then Star 4? Do you have any idea? No, okay. I don't, but there should be a conference button there. Mm, okay, let me try it again. Flash. And then you think Star 4. Hello? Yes, I'm here. All right. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, Kavita, please proceed. That will be the last interruption. <laughs> okay. No problem. Go ahead. Okay. So welcome back, Dr. Asia, and hi, Dr. Dean. So we were on the motivation slide. I was explaining about the statistics found from the United uh, Census Bureau and the World Health Organization among the people that have disabilities. There's about 12% of the population that have a disability, and among them, 73% of them have a physical disability in particular. And on the global perspective, there's about 15% of them that have a disability. And when we look at the elderly population, uh, the population over 60 will double from 11% to 22% by the year 2050. And it will reach two billion. So there's a lot of scope that we can target this population and find ways to assist them. So we're now we're moving forward to the next. So it's common that there are a lot of challenges between the caregiver and person with the disability you see in the kid. So this is noted by Sharon Smith from the San Jose University. They reported that a person with a disability can 
experienced neglect, abuse, limited independence, and loss of priorities. And on the other hand, a caregiver can experience strain and stress from repeatedly doing tasks, and they may uh, feel that they have limited scope for promotion because of their low wages. So these are challenges that is inconvenient for the caregiver and the person with the disability. So if you can find technology to assist them, they're greatly bringing relief. So now I'm going to show you um, three different families that I know that they can also benefit from a robotic system that can increase their independence. Next slide, please. This is family one. It's a couple with a disability. They can easily uh, get more assistance from a robotic system. Next slide, please. Family two, the wife has a disability. The husband is the caregiver, and they have a new baby girl. Next, please. Family three, husband has a disability. Wife is the caregiver, and they have two children. So you can see these three families can greatly benefit from the system. Next slide, please. So our question is, how can people with severe physical disabilities already independent baby? So that's our main focus. Next slide, please. So now I'll discuss some of the grand challenges. There are many, as you can see, that are listed. The ones primary to our research topic is having an accessible and multimodal interaction, acceptability, it has to be accepted and uh, be of use to the people with disabilities. And it has to work in real time. That's very important. So when we need help, we can perform it quickly. Next slide, please. So these are the thesis contributions that I will focus on. First, it's to have one or more prototype designs that can perform, in particular, transferring, repositioning, and personal care. This will help us to characterize the, uh, the parts of design space for the robotic agents as well. And in order to control that robot, we'll design, implement, and evaluate an interface to control it. And we'll also develop and apply qualitative and quantitative metrics that can help us to evaluate the robotic prototype as hardware and the interface that we control. And the most important will be to focus on bandwidth analysis so that planning can be computed and performed in real time because this is data intensive and time consuming. And we will be doing this with the multimodal perspective and to telepresence over the internet. So that's the reason why bandwidth analysis is necessary in our project. Next, please. Now we'll discuss the related work that other people have uh, conducted within this field. <coughs> Next, please. So the concepts of domestic assistance, they started way back in 1927 with service animals in Germany helping World War veterans. And we all know Jackson Cartrone, right? From the 1960s with Rosie the Robot performing household tours. And the first real domestic robot was from the company called Androbot. And I'll tell you an interesting fact that the founder of Android Bot is also the founder of Atari and Chuck E. Cheese. So that's very interesting. And this all happened in the 1980s. So he had two robots. One was the Topo robot and brains on board, brains on board, called Pop for short. So they did primitive tasks 
if you put something on the part, they would carry it to another location, they would speak pre-programmed words and do the basic. And also, they were not successful because of the limited processing power and also the affordability was I think it was fifteen hundred dollars. So not affordable at all. So the next we will look at the iRobot Roomba. So we now it's a vacuum cleaner. It can do the simple chores cleaning the uh, room vacuuming. The primary reason it succeeded was that its underlying principle was simple and it's affordable. So that helps us um, become inspired to do the same. Next, please. So now we're looking at the LE robot created by Georgia Tech and Emory University in 2008. The interaction can be from a touch screen and a laser pointer. So with the laser pointer, if the user clicks on a world with a green light, LE goes to that location, picks up that object, and then when the user clicks the laser pointer again on himself or herself, then he or she will bring it to him. So that's how it happens. So it's a 3D world and the world is clickable and the object is brought close. And the problem is even after the object is brought close, the person has to receive it in their hand. So people with severe physical disabilities may not have the ability to do it. And maybe using a laser pointer may be impractical for them. Next, please. So this is the Manus robot. This is used for arm rehabilitation. And it uses computer's control with virtual reality. And this is a great uh, design. It helps us to realize that after doing research, after doing clinical trials, it reached commercial vision because now this prototype is sold as a product called the InMotion. So it inspires again us to do the same of what the steps are to commercialize a robot success. Next, please. So this is the local mat uh, created by a company in Switzerland in, from 2010. It uses a virtual reality environment. This is for gait therapy on a, thread, on a treadmill using a suspension system. And that's helpful for a user to train their legs so they can gain motor strength. Because motor strength for the legs are very, very important for mobility. And we're going to discuss about that next. Next slide, please. So this is just the basic evolution of mobility. You can see since the dawn of time, right, in 3300 BC, the wheel was invented, then of course the chair, then chariots, and by 1595, King Philip of Spain, he was able to design a wheelchair that helped him be transported. And also, of course, we have the invention of the automobile with the bench in 1886, and Everest and Jennings in 1933 helped design the first modern wheelchair. And also Klein in Canada, he designed the first power wheelchair that had a joystick. So that humanity has always tried to increase, get faster and faster mobility. And some other examples, the Wright brothers with the airplanes, and now we're even exploring across space. So as humans, we always want to become faster and faster and be more independent as possible. Next, please. <clears throat> this is the cow robot, hybrid assisted limb, created by Cyberdyne. 
it's a powered exoskeleton that has the ability to give double the power for somebody to lift somebody or to lift any object. And that's important for mobility and it can help people achieve tasks faster. So when a person with a disability tries to use this, it may be difficult for them. Even though it may help them become more independent, it may be difficult for them to use it because of the lack of muscle strength that they may have. So it's a good example for us to learn and incorporate to think of all the possible users that we may want to target. Next, please. <coughs> so this is the self-operated lift from Stanford University, created in 1988. It uses a remote control as interaction. As you can see, it has wheels, and there are times, a number of times that are soft and can, can be slid under the user. And after it's under the user, the person can be lifted up, put in, in a seating position, and put into one of the chair. So I want you to remember this design because this design helped us create some of the own prototypes that I'll show you later. Next please. This is the robot for interactive body assistant, Viva, by a company in Japan. It was created in 2009 using tactile sensors to lift it up. You can see the pressure detected as it's lifted. So in this image, you can see sequence that's followed to lift the client from the bed to a wheelchair. Again, you see a caregiver is required so the arms can be placed under the client. So again, this does not give the client total independence, but it alleviates the difficulties for the caregiver. And our focus for the research is creating more independence for the user with the disability. Next, please. So what's important after transferring personal hygiene care? And this is the clothing robot, again from Japan, created in 2011. It uses a gestural interface. And after teaching the clothing robot how to move the arms and slide the uh, t-shirt, it's able to perform it after three tries using reinforcement learning. So again, this is great, but the mannequin has to be put exactly in that same position every time in order for this task to be performed <coughs> successfully. And I also want to point out this is the world's first of this type to perform this task. So it's a great uh, direction to, for more progress. Next, please. <laughs> Again, another robot for personal hygiene. This is from Georgia Tech, the Cody robot. It uses a direct physical interface. This is for washing or for bed back. Once the R a 5D tag is placed on the arm, the spatula like thing when it has the washcloth on it, it uses tap planning to find the R 5D tag and wipes it out. So it's able to wipe it with that assistance. Again, it's able to do it when the tag is only on and can perform slow actions and cover a small amount of space. So again, it's a great start, but more work has to be done. Next, please. This is the PR2 robot from Willow Garage from 2010. Telepresence and a joystick can be used for the gripper and for its mobility. It can fold the laundry, can pick up objects, and you can see two pictures toward your right. It has the ability to shave somebody, right? But it's very primitive at this stage. 
I would also say <laughs> from the Robots for Humanity project. And it focuses on users with physical disabilities primarily. And you can see on the image on the lower right, the user is able to scratch himself using PR2. So although this may be excessive for us for our research, it lets us know some of these tasks are very important for us to consider for independent living. So and that's our focus, and we have to keep those things in mind, even the simple things matter. Next slide, please. <coughs> so this is the Beam, Beam Smart presence from Suitable Technologies. I'm using that right now, and it was created in 2012. It gives a lot of maneuverability remotely. I'm using a very simple interface to turn around, to be used with the keyboard, mouse, and even a game Xbox uh, as well. And if we have wireless connection, 4G, it's able to be connected and be used. So it requires high bandwidth. So that's one thing that we have to consider when we build prototypes for telepresence. And the download speed and upload speed also have to be pretty high in order for us to use it and operate it successfully. And these are the photos that I took at the conference, at the Ubicom conference in Seattle, Washington. I was able to look out through the window. So that, I felt like I traveled there, so it was a privilege. And the other photo was taken in the parking lot in California. So it gives me a great opportunity to travel, even though I'm at home. Next slide, please. <laughs> So now I'll show you the five different pilot studies that form the foundation for our thesis topic. Next, please. <coughs> so as I mentioned earlier, path planning is very important for robotics. When, we, when users with disabilities need urgent medical care, Robots can provide this. But the problem is path planning is computationally intensive and it takes a lot of time. So we have to find a way to find an optimal path and find a precise manipulation as quickly as possible. You can see in that image, the robot's goal is to go from point A to point B. But instead of doing that, it goes around the post, throws a couple of times, then reaches point B. So even though it's very amusing and entertaining, it's not optimal. And if we need urgent care, that's not going to be useful to us. So we're going to be targeting that, targeting to solve the problem. Next, please. So in order to do that, we have two approaches. One, we designed a specialized cat. We created a roadmap analogy with the highway and street. The highway can be considered of the reaching main locations and very, very fastly. But the street or the side street can lead to more specific locations, but they may take longer to travel. So as you can see in this image, like reaching out could be considered a highway. And kind of lowering a little bit could be a street. So this is the roadmap analogy that we used to decompose movements. So now in order to handle variations in movement, what we did was we took a number of repetitions of the same task. Then we created a grid. And after creating the grid, we bounded it by the minimum mass in order to create a bounded area. So in this image you see the task of you know something like reaching and moving to get the apple, like you saw in the earlier image. 
So when we down that, we have two subtasks, one for reaching, one for moving. So when we round that, we can find the optimal points between each bounded area. And after we found the optimal start and goal nodes from each of the bounded areas, then we can create an optimal path between them. And that helps to save time when we cache. Next, please. So we wanted to apply this as an experiment. We collected arm data moments from the common kitchen data set from the University of Munich, Germany. And it performed tasks was arm moments performed in the kitchen, like putting a plate on the table, getting it from the cabinet, and putting it down. So we focused on the hand moments primarily. And as I showed earlier, we decomposed those moments, put it on the grid. We found the optimal uh, paths from that bounded grid. We cached that. And in order to uh, compare the times, we found the times with and without cache for comparison. And that helped us to evaluate the effectiveness of our method. Next, please. <clears throat> so in doing that, with and without cache, you can see this is the time it took. The red represents no cache, green with cache. By doing this, we found out that there's a 56% improvement. And this is for the task of lowering the arm of it. Next piece. So similarly, this is for the task of reaching. Again, red, no cache, green with cache. The time is on the y-axis. And there is a 14% improvement. Next please. So this tells us that when we create this roadmap of, of the arm moments and use any style of caching, we are able to save some time with that alignment. And that's very important for us when we also consider bandwidth for our research. Okay, now we're moving forward to the next pilot study. This pilot study, the primary focus was to evaluate the user needs and attitudes toward using a brain computer interface, a BCI. And specifically, we want, we want to focus on limb repositioning because that's very important for people to alleviate pressure sores that they may often suffer from. <coughs> so, for our study, we recruited three people with physical disabilities and examined their needs and preferences. And by using their feedback, we created an interface to move the limbs of an avatar. And we just did that with four subjects. Next, please. So, the first phase of that study, we talked to three subjects with disabilities. They had a variety of disabilities, different disabilities, and their level of functional ability also varied. The one that had the most functional ability was able to perform some tasks. And we also asked them about what their computing needs were, if they needed typing help, moving them out, because that will help us to understand what type of interface to create. As you can see, the one with the most functional ability needed some typing help, needed help to move the mouse. And the two other subjects that had a more severe disability needed more help with even traversing the hierarchical menus and even accessing the computer. So that gives us a good understanding of what type of interface to create based on their physical ability as well. And also during that interview process, we asked them if they were interested in using a VCI. And all three of them, even though they have different levels of disability, said yes. So we used that to create feedback to create an interface. Next, please. 
So this is the 3D interface that was created using Java Swing and Java 3D libraries. And this is this to, for the UCI commands. We used the emotive epoch UCI headset to detect facial gestures and we map them into the interface. To evaluate the performance of the UCI, we use the keyboard and the UCI input to compare how long it would take to perform 10 different arm movements and the number of tries it took for them to uh, complete those tasks also. And the model, yeah, the UCI headset, it has and then 16 outputs, and you have to place them on your head, and it has to have enough moisture to detect the cultural encephalograph data on your head. Right. Next, please. So, uh, again, for that, we have two phases uh, the training phase where the VCI headset was calibrated and the users, the subjects created a profile and they trained their data. And there was a testing phase of uh, performing 10 different algorithms. Specifically, the gestures that we used were to smile, wink, blink, look left, and look right. And after the subjects performed the experiment, we Ask them about their experience in a short interview. Next, please. <clears throat> so these are the results. We found that it took almost a minute and a half more to use the VCI. 90.3 seconds. Well, some facial gestures were detected in a short amount of time. For example, looking to the left to raise the avatar's left arm, and again, similarly to raise the avatar's right arm to look right. The most difficult task was detecting blinks, and that command was used to lower their arms. It may be because of the sensors, or it may be that more training was required. So that made me curious. So we conducted, we want to extend that study. And I'll show you that next, next week. This is pilot study three. We extended back to the mirror work. In this study, we want to focus on getting an in-depth understanding of the user characteristics, more about their functional capacity to use a computer and what other needs that need to be addressed to develop a robotic prototype. And we also want to redesign the GUI to include keyboard, mouse, speech, and also VCI. But this time, in order to find a way to overcome that problem of winking, we used conscious thoughts. Conscious thoughts meaning when the user thinks about pulling an object, that triggers the interface to perform that command. So for we had two conscious thoughts. One was thinking of pulling something, and two was thinking of pushing something. And for the in-depth preview, again, we looked at those same three subjects with the physical disability, and in particular, evaluated their trunk, head, upper limbs, lower limbs, their sitting tolerance, and the type of mobility in the beliefs. Because this will help us to understand how much ability they have to perhaps control a DCI headset that has to be put by themselves. They have to put on themselves. And sitting tolerance is also important because sometimes we want to create user interfaces sitting up, laying down, and everything. So that's very simple. We evaluate that. 
And next slide, please. So in order to quantify their visibility level, we used the Hawkbill index to look at uh, 50, I think 15 tasks and try to find out what their capacity to perform them is. For example, zero would be they need complete assistance to perform it. One would be minimum assistance. Two means no assistance at all, and they can do it independently. So in doing that, you can see subject one had a mild form of a disability, and the subjects two and three had a more severe disability. <coughs> and in that interview process, they also mentioned their most prefer preferred interaction mode was voice. <coughs> The next feedback was helpful to create the interface. Next, please. So this shows you what your current practices are to perform repositioning, transferring, and personal care, and what they envision the future being. Currently, they decline back or use pillows and cushions. For transferring, they use a voice lift or they were lifted by caregivers and personal care assistants. Sometimes they can do all of it, or sometimes they require some assistance, as you saw. And the future, they envision repositioning every 30 minutes or on demand and turning in sleep frequently because most of them did not have a caregiver during night to provide assistance. And for transferring, they all prefer to do transfers in the future. And personal care, of course, is going to be the same because of the needs of people. Next, please. <laughs> Beyond the personal care, transferring, and repositioning, some of the other tasks of interest for cleaning the house, object retrieval, cooking and laundry, something that people with and with our disability can benefit from through a robotic device. So that gives us good feedback too. Next please. So through the interview, we learned some of the design recommendations, have public presence, multimodal interaction, especially speech, uh, that should have a good lifting capacity, be only directional, be safe, reliable, <coughs> intelligent. And when talking to the subjects, they mentioned that they wanted to perform high-level tasks instead of controlling everything themselves. So they wanted some autonomy. And the prototype or the robot aid that would assist them should be durable robots and be waterproof because they will need help with personal care. Next, please. So this is phase two of pilot study three. This was the interface created. In this, you see uh, two avatars. One is male, one is female, one is female, just for the user experience to engage them more. And to evaluate the performance, Dragon actually speaking for speech was used. And the VCI headset was used. And four subjects without disabilities tested this to perform 10 different home tasks on the avatar, moving the elbow up and down and the whole arm at the shoulder level. In the elapsed time and the number of try tries it took to perform those 10 were recorded. Next, please. So this shows the results. You can see the speech recognition and the DCI were comparably the same. But it took longer on average to perform the DCI task than it did for speech. And this, uh, with the speech though, it's expected that in the future, as the user continues to use rather naturally speaking, the speech recognition has the ability to improve through accuracy and correction. Again, with BCI, though, 
this may not be possible. So again, it may be a challenge for people with severe disabilities to use, the, to use a VCI headset, might perhaps drag in a speaking on a longitudinal study could improve. Next, please. So, hey, Kavita. Yes. Can I, can I make a suggestion just in the interest of time to make sure that you have enough time to talk about the, the demos and the future work? I'm going to suggest that you skip four and five okay. and move on to the future work. <coughs> um, and then maybe we can give everybody in the room a second to, just, so there's food. How about we take two minutes to let people grab food? Okay. Um, and then if you don't mind, is that okay with you? That sounds good. Okay, and then let's go ahead and advance to um, the ongoing work slide and pick it up there. Is that okay? Yep, that's fine. Okay, good. Um, okay, so there's food in there. Um, what, if everybody, if you want to run in there and grab food real quick, I'm going to go grab a samosa um, and then come back. Is that is that all right? So so feel free. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. The what? I'm sorry. Okay. Hang on. Just just one minute. I'll also take a break. Okay. See how many users or how many people are viewing these two? Oh yeah. yeah. It's 11 right now. And can you see on YouTube? Uh, these are independent? No, no, this is just I'm checking if, uh, if it's working properly. I'm just broadcasting. Yeah, okay. I know that it's working. <laughs> oh, so there were two URLs that were published. Okay, yeah. Did they both go to the same hangouts? So? Yeah, uh, well, I think the one URL is uh, for this feed, and the other is the direct YouTube channel, which is this one. Yeah, uh, I'm not very sure because the is. What's that? Go for it. No, no, I don't know. I mean, so, uh, uh, Jen, will you be able to do the videos? Yeah, part of it. Okay, yeah. Okay. 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 And the demo is ready. The demo is ready for us. Okay, yeah, let's go. Elena, are you still there? Yeah. Awesome. What about Dr. Ding? Are you still there? Uh, well, I send you some some water bags. <laughs> I thought I heard a noise out of that. Okay, hold on. About 20 minutes ago. Really? Maybe it was somebody dropping off. I don't know. Oh, okay, she says I'm going to drop out the phone line and use Google Hangout, which is easier. Maybe you call me after the presentation. Okay, got it. Oh, yeah, I see her uh, on this Google Hangout page. page. She should be able to hear you. She's on Google Hangout. Well, <laughs> Do you have the robot in your land? <laughs> you have a PR2? Yeah. Not yet. You got the robot set up, don't you? The Baxter. I got the Baxter, yeah. Hey, did you see their uh, ClearPath Robotics is releasing a mobility base from Baxter? Yeah, right. I don't know how good it is. I have specs for it now. Oh, okay. I, I've been talking to them. Yeah. All right, I guess we, we, need, we need pictures of the Baxter. Of something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we can't have socialization going on here. Socializing, not socialization. <laughs> all right. We definitely don't want socialization going on here. All computers on <laughs> No, the. I think of, I think I'm just saying get the, the PR2. So it'll get here. That shit, say it. <laughs> Hopefully it'll get here before I leave. I'm sleep and drive. I just did that sleep. Yeah. Hmm. Well, now we did that just right. Didn't we? Yeah. Make sure that I know. I wonder what it would take to just use that as a telepresence robot. What? The PR2. Uh, the, uh, the PR2 as a telepresence robot? Sure, why not? The PR2? Mix it, I mean, as opposed to buying a bean and a PR2. Um, so, so <laughs> yes. Willow Garage then became, yeah, uh, 
that symbol. It's uh, what is this sort of tell all again? This has a beam. Sort of. That's a beam. I work for the company. Okay. And then just got some of the people in the little garage we can Yeah, yeah. So we we lost people on the way. The whole question was I'm in the process for um, and I was trying to and I was considering it's also thing. ordering it was good. Theme. Was that in there? Yes, sir. It's a brownie. Yeah. Well, I couldn't get anybody to answer my email about it. You want to try one there? Um, <laughs> but I was just trying to figure out if I'm getting a to anyway. Yeah. What it would take to use that as a small person's robot instead of. Uh, Kamita, if you can hear, uh, we're ready to go anytime you are. I'm not sure you need I'm going to reset my gun here, looking down. I understand that. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So now we're going to talk about the ongoing work. I'll show you some of the portraits and designs. Next, please. So we understand that independence is the key for a high quality of life. So in order to achieve that, we need to create a self-directed, transferring, repositioning, and personal care of life device. And that will help users with very severe physical disabilities to be self-sufficient. So then the final target would be to, uh, for serving food and feeding assistance. So you can see in this diagram, first our goal is to work on limb repositioning, then transferring with modular lifter, then personal care, and the last target is food. Next please. So this is our first design. This is the wearable thing. It has 12 hooks and slings for each limb, arms and legs. There's also a sling for the upper body and for the head. So when these slings are attached on the user, the limbs can move and the trunk and the whole body can be lifted up. And I'll show you the demo now. Let me turn around. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so you see the user, you lift it up from the bed, run down, from the sun is disengaged, and she's in the commotion. Can you play it again, please? So again, the slings are attached, slowly elevated, moving away from the bed, brought to the commotion. Slowly brought down, then the slings are disengaged, then she's created. <coughs> okay, next please. So this is the piano mattress. It has nine segments. Each segment is a pocket of air chambers that can be deflated or inflated on demand. And when doing this, this helps to alleviate pressure source on the body. And also there's a perimeter around the bed mattress that those small air pockets can also be deflated and inflated on the edges. So that can be important for those who sit at the side of the bed and they need pressure relief through a thinning pipes. And I'll show you a demo of that. Next please. Ready? Is it playing? No. Yep. Okay. Okay, so the segments go up and down, either one at a time. You see the bottom move in response. Let me show you one more thing. Again, the segments are moving, the whole body can come alternatively in even our eye segments, and also one at a time to help with pressure relief. So please remember that piano office, but I was going to help with this piano lifter prototype. It has five times 
that can go in those three flavored segments of the lactose. And again, as you remember from the Stanford self operated list, this follows the same principle, except it can go five times in the flavored air segments. It has two grippers for hand repositioning to move the right and to move the head. And it uses anchors. And now I'm going to show you the more of that. Ready? Yes, ready. The other lecture, the other lecture comes in as the segments are divided, puts the leg up, approaches to cross them so that the user can move in a unit. Arms are crossed. There's head support. And then reclined up. The legs are placed down. There's also head support now. Arms are held for safety. Legs are put down, then she's free to move. Can you play that again? So again, the other to comes again. Goes under the body. There's no friction then because of the deep braided segments. Legs are crossed. Arms are now crossed. Sitting up with head support. Turning. Putting the legs down. Arms are in place. Head support and then move. Yep. So that's the good design that we've developed. Now I'll show you design three. This is called the Penta Gripper. It follows the same principle. There's grippers, but instead of the wearable sling where it goes around each limb, this gripper tightly kind of arms around each limb, around the arms and the legs, and one for the head. And these grippers may be I was thinking of two design ideas could be air inflated or rigid and motorized. And now I'll show you the demo of that. So this one you see does not require a specialized matrix. It's a regular standard matrix. Arms, then the legs are moved, head support, legs are brought down, goes under the thigh of the arm. And one more thing, please. Goes under the arms. That's the first step. Holds, grips the legs. Head brought to the side. Then the legs are put down. Goes under the thighs and that's it. Things. Okay. Now I'll show you the next project. So you saw the looks three very important for transferring and limb repositioning. The next designs that you'll see are ancillary, meaning that they can be important for other tasks of independent living. And now we'll see the three primary areas that will be for toileting, for brushing your teeth, and for feeding assistance. Next, please. This is the toilet tongs. You see one gripper, and you see a body support pack that a person can lean on, and this sort of tying that goes and wraps around the arm. And there's also hip support, hip support that you saw from the earlier projects. And I'll show you a video again. You see the gripper. So Come out here. Toilet tongs comes, retrieves toilet paper, leans the person forward, works in the back. There's like a faucet today, to be faucet on the tongs. Then play it again. Tongs come closer. 
You see the armrests come down with the whole jack. They use our head forward with the head support. Glass cuts the fork. We choose to join the paper wipes. And we used to use the back and face. And the armrests of the commode chair come down, come up again. Okay. Next, please. So this is showing the features of a powered commode chair. Uh, it's interesting to note that there are powered wheelchairs, but there are no powered commode chairs as of now. So it was interesting to create that and design that feature. And I'll show you the video and how I love it. Next, please. You can see the different features now. Leg rest come down for the side of the headrest move. Arm rest. Tilts back. Leans back. Now it performs the tilting. Arm rest comes. And now it's able to move. You guys want to see that again? Very good. Should we start again? Uh, sure. Okay. So again, foot rest. Head dress moves. Arm rest comes up and down. Leans back. Tilts. Arm rest. I say there's more. Okay, next please. So, this is the robot <coughs> toothbrush prototype. There's three filters and the head support. One filter is for brushing the teeth. One is for spinning and one is for the water supply. Now I'll show you the video next to show you the sequences. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it comes near it holds the head first, brushes, brings the spinner. Brushes again, then both for rinsing them out, the water supply to burn spinning, then the back of the air. So that's very simple. And let us move on to the next one. This is the same principle, except it has one gripper. This can be used for any universal purpose, so it's called mini gripper. And we'll show you in the video next. Okay. So it comes near, picks up food, puts the head support, feeds the load of So it's a very simple task. Okay, next please. So this is the software we created, hopefully to control the robotic project. In this, we looked at creating an interface to control the mattress and the piano that turns into mattress. And we're going to put that as a demo while for the video. So again, we can have that interface up, you know. Are you ready? I'm ready. So as you see, this is the interface that was created. It was created using Humorous Max, Maya, and Adobe Director. And it can run in the web browser. And this is to control the piano mattress and the piano lifter. And you'll see the text at the bottom that indicates what the state of the system is. And then on the left, you'll see the buttons for the camera perspective, and the lower buttons are to uh, issue the commands. So generally, if you click on mattress first, you'll see the piano mattress performing the deflation of the segments. 
So, uh, Kavita, while we're waiting, um, my 10 year old daughter just texted me and said that she's watching. Okay. That's and good. she says, Good luck. <laughs> okay, we're reloaded. Okay. I'm going to click on that first. Okay, yes. Click on that. You see, the state is going through resting, through resting for virtual leave. He's going to take the comments, be free, and then free. Now we click on, well, I'm going to take two click the top camera, right camera, the top camera, or click. Mm -hmm. You can see the top view. Can you click on the right? Left. And this crime left perspective uh, with respect to the mattress. Uh, are you on the right side of the bed? Or are you on the left side of the bed? Okay. Can you click on the right again? Okay. Can you click on sit up, please? So now again, I'm just coming here. Performing the same task we saw earlier. So now the legs are in this position. So now we click on side sitting, which means the legs are going to be put at the end of the bed. And there's a backrest that it pulls from that cabinet and puts it behind. Okay. Now click come out here and then you click follow. Now she's in the commode here. Now we click the toilet. Doors are open magically. <coughs> and she's over the toilet. And now put on shower, please. Yes, can you click on top camera? Right. Left. Okay. Thank you. So this is a simple example of how a robotic interface can be created for either telepresence or can be used locally by the user. Again, this is just a simple example for us to start in the sort of a foundation. Okay, next please. So now we reach the conclusion and discussing the future work. Okay, next please. So as I mentioned, there are no specific products right now that specifically help users with severe physical disabilities to independently transfer themselves by with personal care. So we have contributed by giving some poetry and designs. There were three robot project designs for transferring and a specialized air mattress. A pallet come out here, already made, good brush system, and a universal gripper. We've also shown you an accessible robotic interface that we use for top presence in the future. And the other prototype that we, from that pilot study, helped us to develop some preliminary techniques to handle bandwidth constraints. So these are our contributions so far, but there are still more work that needs to be done. And I'm going to actually share with you my grand vision for a robotic project that we can develop to help these individuals with disabilities. But my main focus for the dissertation will be focusing on the user studies to develop an optimal robotic aid for those tasks and developing an optimal robotic interface that can handle network constraints. So those are the two primary focuses of my dissertation topic. But I'll still show you the big full-time grand vision. So next please. So our first user study will explore the perspectives of robotic users with disabilities. We'll recruit them and ask them to describe this a green robot and its features. And we'll show them 
our prototype designs and ask them to make comments and suggestions. And after that, we'll ask them to recreate another design that may include additional features so we can use that as insight. Next, please. So using that as feedback, we'll understand and analyze what mechanical requirements that we'll need to develop and build this prototype. So we'll find and explore the sort of the mechanical and electrical components and uh, what specific guidelines we may have to follow. For example, it has to be has to have safe car mechanisms and adhere to the Americans with Disability Act accessibility guidelines because in fact they have a lot of structural guidelines that may help us to build the idea for a life and have its dimensions adhere to that. Next please. So after that stage, we'll design multiple GUI interfaces to for that interface to control the robotic aid. And the interface has to be ubiquitous, platform independent, and it has to have privacy and security, of course, because we'll have telepresence. And if a robot has difficulty performing a task autonomously or semi autonomously, an idea that I had was use the idea of mechanical Turk. So there can be a pool of uh, remote caregivers or family members that are available online. And whenever a robot has difficulty performing a task, those, somebody from that pool of caregivers can quickly log in and perform the task. Maybe it's machine related or something that needs additional help that can only be supported to humans. Next, please. So after, again, this is similar to the robotic aid, we'll show the design interfaces to the subjects that we'll recruit, and we'll try to understand what their physical abilities are, how they feel about the interface, and make it optimal for them to use it. Next slide, please. Then we'll refine the software based on that feedback. And that will help us to improve functionality. Next week, user study three is actually running a simulation with a 3D version of that hardware prototype and the interface that we designed and developed. And we'll use a wizard of odds technique to run the simulation in real time so it can be tested. And then after that, we'll have a to do session to understand that. Next week. So this is our primary focus, bandwidth analysis with telepresence. So we have to analyze the trade-offs of what type of internet connection type a user may have, whether it's ethernet, wireless, or even dial-up. And we have to think about where the path planning process takes place, whether it happens locally or remotely. So these uh, factors will be evaluated and the trade-offs will be assessed. For example, in the web interface that we showed you, it uh, almost is about 32 megabits. And when we use Comcast as an example, it may take about five seconds or more for the total upload time. And the total downright, download time may take a second. So we have to analyze it with respect to the speeds of the internet as well. Next, please. So finally, we will reach a stage where we can pattern our prototype design. And that, that stage will sketch it as a technical drawing. And we'll plan the industrial stages of fabrication and testing of the prototype. And at this phase, we want to finish the dissertation. Next, please. So this is the plan, plan of my scheduled milestones. So the 3D simulations, it's now December 2014. We've completed that stage. If we need to refine it, we may. Then we'll be done the user study 
it may take us time to recruit people. So during that time, we'll also focus on hardware specifications, software, and have that completed in that time as well. Then we'll have the user study tool, define the software, have the view testing, and do the bandwidth analysis and system requirements, and have the dissertation completed by May 2017. So that's our plan. Next please. So as a conclusion, I want to state our dissertation topic focuses on building an optimal robotic burn type and simulation and an optimal view to control that robot. And we want to handle network constraints in doing that. And this will increase independence and autonomy for individuals with severe physical disabilities. And that can benefit the standard quality of care and quality of life for people. And it will improve their health as well so that they don't have to rely on caregivers. And it will also shape the paradigm for human robot interaction. And not only would it help me out, it would help uh, people with disabilities you know, everywhere. And also the elderly population uh, now and in future generations. So I'm really happy that this opportunity is available and we can do research in this area. So next slide, please. So I want to thank everybody. Thank you so much. So I want to first thank Dr. Oates for his advice and all his support throughout the years. Dr. Dean, Dr. Feynman, Dr. Nicholas, Dr. Nisha, and I want to also thank Dr. Rutledge and Dr. Clark for their administration. I want to thank Dr. Colbert and Dr. Kane for their guidance with the pilot studies two and three. I also want to thank Student Support Services for their approval of accommodations has helped me throughout these years. I want to also thank my family and friends, my mom and dad, especially. I'm very blessed to receive their love and care. And especially my mom, she's sacrificed her time and drew a lot of support to me. And my dad, I want to thank him because he taught me the value of education. He's also has a PhD, so that's put the bar high for me to reach and it motivates me. I want to thank my brothers, Brad and Rick, for their dedication and time. Rick is here in the back. So thank you, Rick, for coming out. So, and I want to thank Manoj for inspiration, for helping me uh, understand how to overcome obstacles. I want to thank Jen. Thank you so much for helping throughout this project. And it was our dear to be very difficult. Thank you for bringing hope and helping me with the presentation today. And Natasha, are you there? Thanks, yeah. Natasha, for helping me out. You helped with the practice and your friendship really means a lot to me. And thank you for making a lot of arrangements. And I want to thank Tabby. I think she's online watching. She's in Puerto Rico right now. I want to thank her for being a great mentor. And I also want to thank other viewers online and all my friends here that are present here today, and I want to thank the subjects that were involved as well. I want to thank the National Science Foundation, Ford Foundation, Suitable Technologies for during doing the view this evening. I want to thank Dr. Radner, Dr. Blazer at the University of Washington, and I want to thank UMBC Canadian Services for the dinner. So thank you everybody for making it possible, each one of you has made a big difference in my life and it's going to make a big difference for the lives of others. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Kavita. <laughs> so um, I, I think what I'll do is uh, Dr. Ding apparently can uh, see and hear but cannot be heard. So I'm going to try and dial her back in on the phone. Um, so while I'm doing that, why don't we, because I think I've memorized the procedure now, why don't we go around and see if the committee have questions that they would like to ask Kavita? Does anyone want to start? 
Well, uh, I'll start. Um, Kavita, it's a very, very ambitious uh, plan, and I, I suspect that we'll uh, uh, try to help you uh, downsize it to focus in on something that it's uh, doable for your dissertation. Um, so, um, so, so I was trying to sketch out in my mind, you know, the different aspects of, uh, of your uh, design and trying to build build the prototype of uh, these uh, assistive devices. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so you've already done some work in sort of hey, let me um, you back in. some design work, thinking through the functionality and maybe the interface. Uh, I wondered if you could uh, talk to the whether or not you feel like you have the, a good uh, description of the requirements of these different functionality. Uh, different functionalities. Hello? Uh, like I said, Okay, hang on, I'm trying. Can I come closer to you? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Look out for the table. Thank you. Okay. I wrote down things like uh, requirements, uh, interface, uh, understanding what sensors might be needed on the devices, and, uh, whether you want to focus on a subset of devices, uh, subset of functionality. And right. I, I wondered if... Uh, if you have some insight on how you could uh, come up with a subset of some of the things you're trying to do, it might be uh, more achievable. Yep. And, uh, I'm, I'm back. Okay, hang on, let me turn this back in. Maybe a small, my thoughts were Dr. Bowman, but maybe a small set of a goal could be to move just one bit. Perhaps just moving an arm or leg right. would be the first start in order to move progress to moving. All of the quarter, all of the quarter, and then eventually getting into the fifteen and over. So uh, the user can be transferred. So the first goal to attain may be to design a uh, robotic aid to first move one bed. Maybe the arm or the leg. That can help us to understand. I was also mindful of the idea, which I've heard over and over again, that. Uh, if you're trying to build a physical robot, uh, that um, it gets really complicated uh, from a computer scientist's point of view when you have, you know, the physical devices that uh, maybe um, don't quite work the way you anticipate they would. Uh, and so, I, do you think it's possible to carry out a subset of this research program uh, without building some of the physical devices? And finding out uh, whether uh, physically they're feasible or a good good design or a reasonable design. Uh, My thoughts were if we can put this in a high fidelity simulation, I what the strain would be on the might be the strain and stress, perhaps by understanding it from a mechanical engineering perspective of what uh, effects would be. That will give us a good idea of the safety precautions that we need to take. And as compared to something rigid and something that's perhaps filled with air, like air chamber, air inflated uh, robot arm, maybe it's softer. So these features may be more necessary in this type of field as well. So we can think about assessing it in a high-fidelity simulation and to thinking about products that may be more safer than others. And also, we need more expertise from a mechanical engineering perspective. And that will help us to guide us in the right direction in terms of safety. With regard to the interface, I know part of your research agenda was designing good interfaces uh, for a person to interact with uh, robotic devices. And uh, do you think those can be 
designed and evaluated through user studies without having the actual uh, physical uh, robot there or just through simulation? Yes, I feel it can be simulated and you can have a user, as I said, a user of loss technique where the person can respond as if the uh, as if a robot is issuing those decisions. For example, if I put on the command mattress and click and deplete, maybe pillows are moved by a person standing next to them. But using a wizard of Oz technique may help us to um, focus and hone in on how a real robotic prototype may behave given that command. So much of this can be simulated through 3D programs and in real life with the person doing that, performing those tasks. But without using uh, their own common sense or vision, but just behaving as the robot would perform. Okay, now maybe somebody else could. Uh, uh... Well, I would like to echo what Dr. Feynman was saying. First of all, uh, congratulations on a great uh, presentation. Uh, but I would like to echo what uh, Dr. Feynman mentioned that uh, it's way too ambitious for a single dissertation. So if you can uh, maybe uh, work together with uh, Dr. Oates and kind of narrow the scope and try to maybe kind of put your arms around it, either maybe quantitative interfaces or maybe collect, collecting some physiological data and understand the functionality of technology to the system. Parts of people with disabilities, I think this would be a much more doable dissertation. I'm sure you can tackle it, but it will probably take way too long and it would be, you know, big overkill for the required participation. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Asha. Definitely. I, I agree. I just want to, again, put the whole transition of the uh, ambition of dream I have so I can become independent. And again, uh, it may be because of my own personal experience and my need that I want to become independent quickly as possible. So it's shown in my writing and the dissertation topic. So in order to hone it down, again, maybe focusing on the initial design of the robotic aid will be the first focus, and focusing on uh, web interface that may control that robotic aid would be a good point for the dissertation. But I still need all of your insights and feedback in order to fully understand what they should do. Great. No more questions for me. I agree with you, then. Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and commit it. Yes. I'm Dr. Matuzic. I don't, I don't think we've actually met. Um, I'll just point out that it is possible to build, to design and build a robot from scratch during your PhD dissertation if you want to take as long as I did. Um, yeah. How long is that? Seven years. But uh, of which about a year and a half was designing and building a robot, just the mechanical aspects of it. That said, um, I think there are maybe some mechanical challenges to the designs that you were showing that uh, are not necessarily deal breakers, but the ways I can think of to kind of work around them strike me as expensive. Um, so if you want to get into maybe not building a complete prototype or maybe building a complete prototype, I would, you know, I'd love to see it. But uh, but if you wanted to talk about sort of the mechanical capabilities and what it would take to make one of those prototypes reality, one of the things you might consider is actually working with, you know, me or somebody in the mechanical engineering department I can put you in touch with just to do a feasibility analysis of the design, not to build it. But just say, what would it take to do this? What would it take to do this? And that gets you part way to something that could actually be built and deployed without actually forcing you to do things like write drivers, which I really, I really cannot recommend. <laughs> just say it. If you were going to, I really appreciate your feedback. Thank you. 
if you're going to pick just one of those uh, devices you, sh you sort of show prototypes of, a simple one, uh, does, does sort of one come to mind, like the one that helps brush your teeth or uh, helps, uh, helps you uh, lift you out of bed? Okay, the wearable thing is actually the simplest because that's, uh, that's inspired by the patient voice grip that's available now. But now it's used by, it still needs caregivers to put that sling around. But the user with a disability cannot use it independently. They still need help. So perhaps using a sling around one of them if it's surrounded, but if it gets away, they can put it on independently, then the limb can be moved. Right. So I, you know, I, I, of course, agree with the the need to sort of narrow and focus. And I, it, it seems to me that there are two general directions you could think about going. Um, one is, I think, actually kind of focusing on the interface, which is to say if we had a feasible prototype, maybe you know, where feasibility is explored in the way that um, Dr. Matusik was saying, right, then you could say, all right, this looks like it's something that could actually be constructed, and then you can start thinking about the control issue, the interface issues, right? So um, if the interface is going to be sitting there with a the person, that's one thing. If the interface is going to be sitting remotely, then that's another case. So then you could start thinking about, you know, what are the issues that come into play there? So what are the what are the HRI issues? And then also sort of what are the communication issues that are, that are at play? The other is to sort of push harder on the um, prototype side, on the construction side, which seems like that's a, a very rough go um, for you personally. So, I mean, I think kind of narrowing it down and saying, okay, let's pick one of these designs. It could be limb repositioning. It could be the, the entire wearable sling. Um, and then saying, okay, let's think about the interface and, and, and like, let's do that first to get that right. Right, I think that could turn into that could be the core of a, a good thesis in this area that gets you moving in the direction that you want to go long term, and then allows you to tackle some of these other issues um, in your career post human VC. Okay. That's sort of the way I look at it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, Dr. Dane, go ahead. Okay. Um, I cannot hear uh, Fabita that well, but I can hear you guys pretty well. I will well. come closer. Uh, to translate a little bit what she said to me. Okay. Um, I think I, I, I hear all those questions. I agree with you too. I think um, Chris Vida has done a great job putting everything together. It's such a very thorough review of the existing technology. And also very related by the uh, thinking about designing new devices. And I had some experience like in, in our lab, we do a lot of like the design and development. And also, uh, we do some sort of interface design. We interface with users a lot, especially users with disabilities. And so I have very similar concerns as uh, what you um, already mentioned. And like the mechanical and also electronic design of all the uh, device, uh, all the equipment that she designed, um, it's going to be taking a long time. Um, I'm not sure without that prototype how the interface will be able to interface with the real design. So I'm not. It, it wasn't clear to me that to what point this prototype will be developed, and so the interface can be um, further developed upon that. And the other thing I think is like there's so many designs to address so many problems. Each one of the problem is an important problem. And so I don't know whether we should um, combine all of them together. Maybe I think another way to narrow it down is to focus on one thing. Like we have done like a lot of work on transfer devices, and um, we ha um, I know companies and are working with us. They already designed these transferring devices, and our lab just recently licensed the technology to a robotic company and to develop a strong arm to help people with transfer. And so those are long-term projects. It's not like. Um, um, it's like to take multiple students and to develop that, and that transfer alone is is is, is difficult enough. And um, the self care is another area, and also the pressure um, like adjustment is, is sort of that might be able to to get uh, go together with the transfer. But I think each individual area can be it, it may be able to just um, focus on one area rather than on um, a lot of areas, and then maybe um, she will be able. To to focus on 
her attention in, in, in certain area and, and, and to look into what is existing technology, even the commercial product that's out there to help with um, either transfers or self-care. So it, it will be more focused uh, from the, from the uh, prob problematic area perspective. And so that's kind of, I can give her some information that what we have done, and but I'm not sure um, from the, I think she's in computer science, so right. focused on too much on mechanical engineering, and there's so many issues with mechanical. I mean, we do we build our own robots, and there's so many issues um, to build it up, and it takes so long to be able to actually make it work reliably. So, but I don't, I just don't know to what extent her project will focus on that, and then it's how that related because she she's basically proposing a whole system. Yep, that's right. Right, I agree. Yeah. I think my, my, my intuition is in agreement with yours that I think kind of shying away from the mechanical construction is the right way to go um, because it's not a mechanical engineering or even sort of, a, you know, electrical engineering kind of thesis. So I think if we can stay in the realm of simulation, um, that's going to be a big win and then focus again on the interface issues. Or and, and I agree, Dr. Ding, that narrowing it down to one of the tasks is a good thing to do. Thank you, Dr. Ding, for the feedback. I agree in focusing on perhaps the most important is memory positioning <coughs> first, or it could be transfer. So either one of those and in simulation with the interface, maybe a good amount of anticipation. Yeah, Cynthia? Of those two, I would I would suggest that limb repositioning is, I mean, Dr. Ding probably knows more than I do and can offer comment, but limb repositioning is, is mechanically seems like slightly an easier problem and also one that isn't quite as much an area of current research. Than lifting. Than, than yeah. transfer. Transfer yeah. is, is really yeah, a difficult I, problem. I, I, I definitely agree with you. I think um, lift positioning is a lot. E it should be easier than transfer. Transfer is a serious problem, yeah, right. and there are a lot of like uh, innovations around that area most recently. And um, but still, it's a big problem. Not only just like for independent transfer, also for assisted transfer. There's a lot of like uh, there's a big area around that. So I think that's a that's a very um, challenging problem to tackle. But when, in comparison, lift positioning is relatively easier. Well, and you can and imagine some of the self care is also not so difficult. It's just comparatively, it's a lot like just focus on the toothbrushing, and that also seems to be able to um, tackle easily than the transfer too. It's also unlike transferring understudied. Say that again. It's unlike transfer um, independent self care like specialized tasks as opposed to a broad purpose robot is understudied. Transfer. A lot of people are working on transfer. Right. Okay. So, all right. So that that's all good advice. It seems like shying away from sort of the big movements of lifting and transferring and looking at more specialized tasks, limb repositioning, personal care, doing that potentially. Into, although I guess it becomes more feasible to think about doing studies with a, a physical robot in that case, um, uh, and then sort of working out interface issues there. Then that kind of narrows it down and makes it much more approachable. Just my suggestion. Yeah. You can do any of this, but yeah. I would figure out what it is worth doing immediately. Okay. Anything else? Uh, any, okay. Going once, going twice. Okay. Why don't we thank uh, Kavita one more time? Uh, so, Kavita, you need to leave the room now. <laughs> um, okay. So what we'll do is the committee, everybody except the committee, will will go. Please go get food or something. Yeah, um, everybody got something to eat. And I don't, Kavita, I don't know which way you want to go. I'll go. Do you want to go in the kitchen? Uh, Hang on a second. Here. Hang on, you're hung up on the. Let me send you that way. <laughs> All right. Do you want to head out push the people kitchen? around? <laughs> do you want to head towards the kitchen, maybe? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think we're done. Thank you very much.